Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. There is a day that is still burnt into my memory. It was a winter day in January 1994. That was eight years old back then. I just left our school building when I saw this girl outside from my neighborhood with an older woman which I didn't know. I realized that they were waiting for me. They were there to tell me that my mother had just been in a severe car accident. And they took me and my sister back home where we waited for my father to return from his work. On the way home, we had to pass the site of the accident, which was just a few hundred meters from our home. Later on, I learned that the other car had been speeding, and the driver on that snowy winter day and the bad visibility simply did not notice my mother's white car at the intersection. These were the days before all the cars had safety features like airbags that protect you from the severe consequences of a crash. My mother was fortunate. She survived, and after several months at hospitals, she learned to walk again and adapt to a new life. However, her life until today is affected by the limited risk awareness of one individual. While I hope that you don't have a similar experience with family members or friends of yours, I'm sure we all remember moments where the actions of others, or even your own actions, had severe consequences that could have been avoided with little more awareness for the risks around us, for the risks in our environment. Despite all the warnings by scientists, by politicians, by activists and students in the streets, and more recently also business leaders, today we are on the trajectory to crash our climate. Despite all the announcements to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by governments and by companies, there is still this huge gap to reduce greenhouse gas emissions down to safe levels as they were defined in the Paris Agreement and to keep global warming to well below 2 degrees Celsius. Ecosystems, livelihoods and our economy depend on a healthy planet and we must avoid this crash. Let me talk you about the number that has been bothering me recently. It's the number 200. With only 20 centimeters of sea level rise and the ongoing population growth, 200 million more people will be exposed to extreme um, sea levels and coastal flooding. Just to visualize that, if you stack 200 million people, the one at the top could basically touch the moon. Besides island nations that are affected, also major coastal cities that we have visited will be affected by this. 200 million people every year will be in need of international humanitarian aid by 2050, which is a doubling compared to today's numbers and partially due to climate change. Every year, 200,000 square kilometers of agricultural land will become too degraded for crop production or lost to urban sprawl. And coral reefs would decline by 70 to 90 percent in a one and a half degree warmer climate, and we would lose almost all of them in a two degree warmer climate. There's this proverb that says that you cannot have fun without taking risks. So, no risk, no fun, they say. I think today is the time to rethink that life approach and to say yes to less risk. If you all say yes to less risk, I think we can have this more fun and sustainable future together. We can build that. Saying yes to less risk does not mean not taking personal or business risks. I think these risks are essential for a thriving and innovative society and to tackle the challenges that we have today. However, I think all of us, and business leaders in particular, need to, get, need to give more considerations to the risks around us, the risks in our environment, along the value chains of organizations. I think my personal risk, awareness for risk has been strongly influenced by my childhood experience. But during my career, I learned that risk perception and the mitigating actions are not something that often come natural to most people. And there's a reason for that in how our brain works. But let's first have a quick look at what risk actually means. And there's a quite a nice, simple description in the Cambridge Dictionary. Risk is the possibility of something bad happening. I think we all have a very good understanding of what something bad means. 
but we often struggle with the concept of possibility or its quantification through probability. Through evolution, we have become excellent at, at recognizing immediate threats and acting up on those. I think if you encounter a tiger in the wild or if you see a child crossing the street in front of your car, it's essential that we react immediately and take the right decisions immediately. Our brain has been excellent at drawing mental, mental pictures of things going bad. But I think all of you who went through one of those exciting probability courses would agree there are more intuitive things in life than assessing probabilities. And let's just go back to uh, one of the examples from high school. We have this urn that contains 23 balls, eight white, six blue, and nine red. We draw six balls at random. What is the probability of uh, selecting three blue, two white, and one red ball? Well, if you would need to take those kind of uh, calculations into consideration to assess whether a tiger is a threat to us, then Bon appétit. <laughs> of course, we don't always need to take decisions under time pressure, but our mental capabilities to do long-term risk assessments or even planning are still very much stuck in version 0.5 in evolutionary terms. We have this high-speed, intuitive, hazardous K processor in our brain that ensures our survival in a moment of danger. And then, on the other side, we have this slow-speed processor with still quite a few bucks that is responsible for the analytical parts, for the mathematics, for the probability assessments. And you might guess, they often really struggle to talk to each other. The American psychologist Daniel Gilbert explored this topic in his research. And one of the fundamental problems he found with addressing climate change is that our brains have not been designed to combat the slow-moving enemy. And I think climate change is one of those self-made, slow-moving enemies, but with severe and often irreversible consequences. And I think also we don't address climate change with the necessary urgency because we keep seeing global warming as a threat to our future, not our afternoons, as Daniel Gilbert said. We study climate change, we watch movies about climate change, and we experience natural disasters. And we get outraged because nothing is happening. And then the slow speed processor in our brain starts pondering over those ever-growing probabilities that those risks will eventually also affect us personally. And then, as a consequence, we don't act the way we would if we would stand in front of a tiger, but we continue with our lives and wait until the problems eventually arrive at our doorsteps. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown that a huge global effort is possible to reduce risks to our lives. However, there's no vaccine against climate change and time is running out to mitigate the worst impacts. Another problem with climate change is that it is often not just the immediate impacts, such as warmer temperatures due to greenhouse gas emissions that will lead to the most severe long-term consequences, but it's the many secondary effects. Like in a car crash, it's not necessarily the initial injuries that will make your life difficult for decades to come, but the secondary effects, like psychological ones, that not only affect the person itself, but also the person's friends, the person's families. When we look at climate change, or the loss of coral reefs. It's not just the loss of those coral reefs, but it's the impact on the biodiversity, the impact on the food chain, on the coastal communities that depend on it, or even the political stability in those regions. I think it's these secondary effects of climate change that can cascade with the destructive force and the power to spread isolated events across the whole globe. And I think it's these secondary effects that make our global society, our global interconnected society, much more fragile. Suddenly, it's not just the drought in the Middle East, that can, but it can be the spark to a collapsing political and economic system. Suddenly, it's not just the flood in Thailand, but it can be the trigger to supply shortages for global IT companies. And suddenly, it's not just the melting polar ice caps, but it can be the submergence of major coastal cities. 
After working for several years in the reinsurance industry where I assessed climate risks, I recently co-founded the startup where we tried to help organizations become more resilient by uncovering those secondary effects of climate change. We try to understand what are the risks in the environment that will affect the organization, but also the other way around, how an organization affects everything and everyone along their value chains, along their supply chains. With technology and the power of forward-looking data and visualization, we try to overcome this inherent struggle in our mind to do long-term risk assessments and to understand what these risks mean for organizations, not just today, but also in the future. And to give you an example of this interconnectivity of global risks, I would like to take you on a little journey based on this cell phone here. Of course, you all know there are many different components in here in this cell phone. We have some com components, electrical components from Asia, like countries like China, Japan, South Korea, or even the Philippines. Then we have raw materials that go into the battery, for example, from the Democratic Republic of Congo or for, from Rwanda, then also some European countries that contribute to that cell phone. And then we have some components from Peru and from the United States of America. I think almost every product today has a global journey behind it. And I would like to invite you to go on a journey behind the products in your hand, on you, in your home. Activate the slow system in your mind to go on that journey and question your, react, your actions, your decisions in your daily life. I think it's important to realize that not every country here on this map has the same capacity to adapt to changing climate and to increasing climate risks. How can you, with the decisions that you take, with the products that you buy, or the organizations that you support, ensure that the people most exposed to climate risks will have the means and the capacity to adapt to a changing climate and make themselves more resilient, not just today, but also in the future. Today, I feel we are still in a speeding car. We struggle to control it, and we struggle to see the obvious risks around us and the risks that loom in the future. We need to find the brakes to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but we also need to realize that our climate is already changing. Slowly, but it will accelerate and it will lead to devastating consequences. The next time you buy a product, the next time you take a business decision, the next time you vote, or even just the next time you decide on how you travel on your next holiday, I would like to invite you to take our planet on a journey with you, on a drive, as if it was a family member or a good friend sitting next to you in a car, not strapped on the roof. Have a conversation about how you depend on each other, how you can make each other stronger, how you, you can reduce the risks to yourselves, but also to others, how you can ensure that your gains are not someone else's losses. Also talk about how you can install the seat belts to reduce risks, how you can install the lifelines that will absorb the shocks along this journey. These thoughts don't often come naturally to us. We need to actively and consciously think about those aspects. But I believe if we do so, I think we'll be more successful together in what we do, we'll be more successful in how we run our businesses, and most importantly, it will make our world stronger and more resilient to the risks we face. Thank you.